the rhetoric is, if you build a freeway, it's good for the economy. If you build a, a transit system, it's just a black hole to pour money into. It's nonsense. In the 1990s, Peter Newman's Institute for Sustainability and Technology Policy was commissioned by the World Bank to study data on urban development and transportation in dozens of cities around the world. This landmark study found marked differences in the developed world between the European and wealthy Asian cities which focused on public transportation and the Australasian and American cities that have focused on building motorways. We find that the cities with the most car dependence, that is they use cars almost exclusively, they have very little public transport option, um, they have the highest proportion of their wealth going on transport. And we find that it, uh, in automobile dependent cities it's uh, at least 13 to 14 percent and it rises as high as 20 percent. Uh, in the European and wealthy Asian cities like Singapore, Tokyo and Hong Kong, it's between 5 and 8 percent. And that's a huge difference. It means that those cities that are car dependent are working an extra day a week just so they can move around in a car. According to Newman's data, Auckland spends around 16 percent of its city wealth on moving people around. That's four times higher than the Danish capital of Copenhagen. So what is it that Auckland is spending all of that money on that a city like Copenhagen isn't? They are very proud now to announce that 36% of the people commuting to work do so on a bicycle. 23% only use the motor car and 33% use the public transportation system. Of course the way the, the traffic is organised in our city makes uh, makes the expenditure for, for the city and also for the individual citizens much less. You can easily live in our city without having a car. The government isn't making any effort to reduce the sheer volume of cars that we're importing. And the only way, practically speaking, that you'd be able to do something about and wean people out of their cars is once again provide options so that they don't need it. If you improve transportation by, um, by improving uh, public transit service or van pooling, car pooling, bicycling, that some of those households can avoid uh, buying a second car or maybe even buying their first car. If you're talking about just reducing the number of cars a family has to own from four vehicles to three, or three vehicles to two, that's the way ahead. This last August, we spent 40% more importing crude oil than we did in the August before. It's not because we're increasing the quantity, it's just because the price has gone up. Because of all the expenditures consumers make, filling up their, their, the tank of their car with gas provides about the least amount of economic benefit. There is a finite amount of oil in the ground and eventually we're going to reach the point A where it's exhausted absolutely and conservative estimates say that's going to be in the next 30 or 40 years and B we're going to quickly reach the point where demand exceeds the ability of oil producing nations to supply it. New Zealand is so vulnerable on that front. You import all your oil. The reason why Auckland spends so much of its city wealth on moving people around is because we're all moving around in individual imported metal boxes running on imported oil. Auckland's car dependence is sucking its economy dry. So it's a bit strange that roads gobble up all of the transport funding because they supposedly provide more economic benefits. You've got to wonder how those economic benefits are being calculated. There's huge holes you can draw in the way benefit cost analysis is done. Uh, on freeways, we have criticised them endlessly and nothing ever changes. They, for example, they incorporate the main benefit is time savings. You're saying let's assign a dollar value to all the very small changes that happen when somebody builds a big roading project. Some people will save 30 seconds, some people will save five minutes for a while. And we'll add all those up. And we'll add them all up 
and assign a dollar value to those added up savings and say that's a saving to the economy. Now we know that's nonsense. That's, by that argument, the state would buy everyone a dishwasher. The reality is you don't save time for long because the freeway fills so rapidly that you're pretty much back to where you were. And at the same time, people who were in public transport sometimes switch to using cars. You're making it uh, easier for people to travel and um, so not surprisingly people will take additional trips. Over the last 15 years a mountain of studies have proven that new roads breed more traffic. A British government report concluded that ignoring even a small amount of induced traffic could significantly overestimate the benefits of building roads. But in some parts of the world we pretend induced traffic doesn't occur at all. Gee, motorways must be the only uh, product in the world whose makers say that if they provide a better product they won't get more customers, but that's what the ARC's transport model says, and that's just rubbish and nonsense. The modelling that's done tends to be biased in favour of roadway capacity expansion solutions and biased against the alternative solutions to transportation problems, and the, the fact that it overlooks induced travel is part of that bias. The land use implications and the uh, induced traffic implications are never brought into these uh, benefit cost analyses and uh, if they were you very rarely would end up with a positive. The economic analysis done by our government institutions has serious flaws. So how credible then would an analysis done by the roading lobby be? The Allen Report was produced by the roads lobby to argue its case for more roading. It was treated as a kind of tome, if you like, on which um, the truth was written. The Allen Report claimed that completing the so-called Western Ring Motorway would result in $838 million in annual economic benefits. Pretty soon, everyone was quoting this figure as if it was a proven fact. From the New Zealand Herald, to the head of transit. The key piece of Auckland's specific evidence in the report was a terrifying chart showing average travel speeds in Auckland declining rapidly, a problem that could of course only be solved by building more motorways. It was part of the roads lobby's response to what it saw as the perceived threat of moving towards a more balanced transport policy. But when I looked at the original source of the Allen Report's data, different picture emerged entirely. This data said transit was not comparable because severe weather had caused road flooding and accidents which had slowed travel times down. Oh and this data wasn't comparable either because it measured different parts of the road network. So there was no trend but this deliberate deception worked like a charm. Don Brash liked the chart so much that he included his own version of it with a speech he gave to the Automobile Association during which he praised the Allen Report repeatedly and promised a massive increase in roading expenditure. But the big coup for the Allen Report came in the 2006 budget. Then we saw the announcements of significantly increased funding for roading for expanding the state highway network. Ironically, transit's figures showed that average travel times had actually remained relatively constant for several years. If you don't increase roadway capacity, um, traffic achieves uh, an, becomes self-limiting. There, there, the the amount of uh, vehicle trips will not increase, even if population increases. Then later in 2006, transit recorded rising travel speeds and less traffic on Auckland's roads. The cause of this wasn't any flashed new motorway, but rather the rising cost of fuel. Anyone who keeps putting their head in the sand and believes that these motorways have a, a long-term benefit is absolute rubbish and it, they will be looked on as not only having missed an opportunity to put into a rail but, have, but to be completely irresponsible because if you are building infrastructure that is going to require cheap oil to keep it going, you are wasting your time.